Boo Bitches! Welcome to episode 77 of C3, Crystals, Cauldrons, and Cocktails. Today, we are going to talk about mushroom magic. Um, and since Ostara is coming up, we are going to try to do a little bit about that as well. Oh, I forgot to say, I'm River. Oh, I'm Ren. <laughs> I'm over here going along with it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Mushroom magic. Okay. Oh, yeah, I, up the see, big things. We forget to. Are we, I forgot. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, what are we drinking? Mm-hmm. So since Ostara is coming up, I wanted to do something springy. Um, February was all about pink cocktails. So Mm -hmm. I've come up with something a little bit different. I call this one the Blackberry Boo. It is rum, blackberries, vanilla extract, simple syrup, and mint to garnish. And you top it off with club soda, as much or as little as you want to add into that. And it's really light and refreshing. I, I like club soda. Some people don't like it. I had a friend who said it tasted like cardboard to her. So yeah, um, I'm I'm not a fan of club soda i'm just not a fan of like carbonated water type of thing i was i, I was just about to say well i think you could use any kind of carbonated water yeah. but <laughs> never mind but i think it also might be good if you add in raspberries or strawberries yeah. for like a a mixed berry drink as well i might have to try that variation next time and see yeah. but this this is pretty good I, I love blackberries though so oh yeah it's very good i added uh sprite to mine to have that bubbly. yeah that's a good idea See, and I think I could also use La Croix flavors to add in, like a lime La Croix. I'm big yeah. on lime. You know, I, I know like you are. lime in all my yeah. cocktails. So all kinds of, um, when we do our cookbook f- with the cocktails in it, well, this one is probably going to have a bunch of different variations to it with different associations because, you know, blackberries by themselves might might correspond to something. But if you add strawberries, those correspond to something. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway, I also want to say I'm really excited that my husband and I are going out of town soon. We're going to Las Vegas. I know. I am so excited. We are going (laughs) to stay for four nights. And you know how he's afraid of heights? Yeah. He booked us a helicopter ride over Las Vegas. Can you believe it? No way. He did that for me. How romantic is that? No way. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of ruin the whole thing. Have you seen that movie? Uh uh I don't remember what it's called. It's on Netflix. It's a Netflix original uh oh. where they it's like the zombies and they have to get into Vegas. It's like zombies in Vegas yeah. and that's like where the quarantine is. And they had to go in to like uh, steal something. Yeah, they had to go yeah. steal something, and they had to like tr- like fly something over Vegas. That's the only image of Vegas that I have in my head. <laughs> well, I I don't want to visit Vegas when like, it's the zombie yeah, apocalypse. But that would not it, be in, fun. In the movie, it was only Vegas that was zombie apocalypse. Like I like vaguely was, remember that they had I, like quarantined, quarantined it, like you it said. off, you know, and so only things in that why didn't they just make it then well that's the point of the show is like oh. they were on a timeline because they, oh, were, going they were going to, to nuke yeah. it and that's they needed right. something out of like a safe it was like a lot of money or whatever. yeah there's more than one in that series of movies there's two of them yes they're yes. some of my favorite movies but i whenever, love zombie movies i love them too and whenever you whenever you when i when you first told me about your las vegas trip I, that's the movie i thought of i was like oh <laughs> That's where the zombies are. I, I'm really excited. I, I'm hoping, I mean, I can't believe he booked, I mean, he surprised me with that today. He told me uh, the helicopter ride, but he's made reservations at the Ferris wheel during happy hour. Okay. So we're going to go on the Ferris wheel for happy hour. We're going to go to, he's already made reservations at some really fancy restaurants, like the dress that I have to wear is super fancy. It's like what you would oh. wear to a, a wedding except for it's black so you don't really wear that to weddings but I anyway mean, yeah I mean, it, <laughs> it's so fancy um so it, it's gonna be great to have some alone time with him it's been really hectic my dad passed away late last year we're still dealing with trying to help my mom with the estate constantly having to travel out of state to deal with that is very difficult and i've had some health issues because of it and i think 
that kind of scared my husband. And so mm-hmm. he's, he's like, I'm going to whisk her away. It's so oh, romantic. I'm so, so excited. Nice. That's I know. so exciting. I now you just got to make sure that the helicopter like doors are closed for the sake of your husband. <laughs> yes. It's supposed to be. He said it's a glass encased in glass, the whole oh. side windows. So we'll be enclosed, but I there don't will know. be glass like, protecting us. He is going to be a little no, scared, no. I think. I'm right there with your husband where I am terrified of heights as well, right? That's so funny. And uh, uh, my husband and I, we go on frequent walks around our city. Mm-hmm. And one of the things we have to cross over is a bridge. And you can like kind of see through some parts of it with the slats on the ground. It's like you look over a river and stuff. Yeah. I can't. I it terrifies the crap out of me. And we're on a bridge. It's just because I can see underneath it where (laughs) I guess it's my instinct, wink wink from last week's episode. My instinct where my body just like is fight or flight mode where you're like, oh crap, there I can see down and it's far down. So my body like it's triggered into like this, like that doesn't terror. scare me. I have my irrational fear is tight spaces. I am claustrophobic, and I mean, it's totally tiny, <laughs> totally irrational. This fear, I don't, oh, no, I don't know I mean, why. I'm claustrophobic too. Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> wow. I know. No, I'm claustrophobic too, but I think that's just because my older sisters used to sit on me. <laughs> Oh, big family. I, I have a big my, family too. Yeah, my older sister used to sit on me if I didn't do what I what she wanted me to do. And so <laughs> I know that sounds terrible. And I think it was, but now she used to sit on my chest and I couldn't breathe. And so now I associate that feeling with like like it's claustrophobic. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Way to go, sister. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I think this episode's gonna be long as it is. Oh, I didn't yeah, look at the yeah. time, so I'm looking at the time now. Um, We may have to split this into two episodes, um, especially since we want to talk a little bit about Ostara too. Mm -hmm. And Ostara is coming up. That'll have to be in the first episode because I want to talk about it before Ostara comes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Just a little bit about it. Because we've done, I think we did a whole episode on it the first year that we did this. Wow, it's been over a year. That's crazy. Okay, mushrooms. Woo! What is a mushroom? I mean, everybody knows what a mushroom is, but it's a let's fun guy. Yeah, it's what a is fun guy? <laughs> oh my god, we're fun guys here. <laughs> you can't well, say we can't do a mushroom episode without, without a joke yeah. like that. Come on, that's come a Ren joke, though. We're oh my fun god. guys or fun girl. I don't know, girls. Uh, we're fungers. It's fungers. <laughs> Okay, so mushrooms are a fungus. Speaking of that, have you watched that series on HBO Max that's out right now? The um the one that was yes. based on the video game. What is it? The Last of Us. Yes, I'm all caught up now. Uh, I'm caught up. To, well, I don't know if I am. When does it come out? I might be out. Uh, it comes I might out be like behind. Sundays. Sundays. I might be nine. behind an episode then. Okay. I think you are. Anyway, so. It's, it was started as a video game, and now they've made this show on HBO about it, which I watch on HBO Max. That's why I said that, but I think it's uh-huh. just HBO. Anyway, and I think that show has given a lot of people a very different perspective about fungus. You yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I even in my mind, when we were talking about Vegas and zombies, I was like, oh, shoot, we're about to talk about fungi I and know. the whole new craze is this new show the last of us that's out and it's about fungi and how it can turn you into zombies so i was like wow okay i know very I'm alluding cool. to the right hopefully the, this will reach the right audience and y'all will be like yeah yeah for sure <laughs> so there are both poisonous mushrooms and edible mushrooms and there is a place for both of those types of mushrooms in witchcraft a mushroom or a toadstool is a is the fleshy, spore-bearing, fruiting body of a fungus, typically produced above ground on soil or on its food source. Toadstool generally denotes a poisonous one to humans, as opposed oh. to mushrooms, which are not poisonous. Okay, okay, but, okay. But they're both mushrooms. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. So the term mushroom and its variations may have been derived from the French. Oh. They have a word mousseron, which I took French, so I should have a French uh, accent, but I don't think that came across in there. Nope. Which <laughs> is their word for moss, which uh-huh. apparently moose is moss. Okay. Um, delineation between edible and poisonous fungi isn't clear cut. So a mushroom might be edible, it might be poisonous, or it might be edible but unpalatable. Okay, yeah. I've read some things about mushrooms. I guess not read. I don't read. I've watched some things on TikTok. Read? (laughs) Well, you do TikTok more than you read, but you do read. But I don't read about mushrooms. So I TikTok about mushrooms and, well, not really. It just is on my For You page. Okay, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) So I, I watched that a lot of the mushrooms, like you can't really tell if they're, you know, poisonous. And like some of them are like, oh, yeah. Those are poisonous, but you only know that if you study it and if you yes. like, have like read about these things. And yeah. so it's hard if you're just out and about and you see a mushroom. Yeah, definitely. Don't, don't need it. Don't, you know, some of them you are so poisonous, you can't even touch the stem. Uh, the Ooh. Is it called a stem? I mean, yeah. And the I did read somewhere that on poisonous ones, the gills that are underneath the cap uh-huh. are very white. Oh, but, you know, like when you eat the button mushrooms that we eat, they're brown underneath. Okay. But supposedly so, poisonous ones are very white, but I don't, I don't, don't, don't take my word for it. Please don't go eat one and say, yeah. oh, it's brown, so I'm safe. No, no. Yeah, no, no. But I'm trying to think of a joke about the white underneath. So I don't know. I can't think. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you know? That the word toadstool first appeared in the 14th century in England as a reference for a, quote, stool for toads to sit on. Oh. And they think that that was because that was the way they implied that it was poisonous, that that one that a toad sat on, a toadstool is a poisonous one. So the, the term toadstool is often connotated with the poisonous mushrooms. Okay. So toads can sit on poisonous ones and not be affected? I have no idea. I don't know. (laughs) I have questions. (laughs) Me too. So mushrooms technically are fungus, as we said, but not plants. They're not plants. Oh. Some would argue that anything that grows organically is a plant. Mm -hmm. But scientifically, plants are in a totally different, what is it called, genus or category? Genus, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's that's your side. That's not my side. I'm not the science one. But mushrooms provide multiple functions in both nature and as food. Okay. But they're actually genetically more similar to us as humans than they are plants. Oh, that makes the last of us. Isn't so I know the whole last of us things. I was creepy. I was doing research for this. The last of us was like in my head the entire time. The entire time, yeah. Oh, gosh. See, I'm over here. I want to talk about portobello mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms. And well, these mushrooms are over here. Like, like they're like, it's they're closer to our DNA than, you know, <laughs> they're like, going to oh, take geez. over our bodies and we're all going to be zombies. We're oh, going to be fungus, fungus zombies. Oh, gosh. OK, so mushrooms, mushrooms belong in the kingdom fungi which boasts more than 144,000 known species and also includes mold, yeasts, and rusts. Those are all forms of fungus, which I Uh -uh. thought was... Yeah, yeah. Isn't that weird? I mean, don't... I'm not a scientist. I just... Okay, well, rust is like... Okay, rust is based on... Oxidation. Basic knowledge, yeah. It's a a literal chemical change in something. Yeah, like. Like oxidation a of change. metal. Yeah, a physical change. You can take it back, but a, a something that rusts, like you, it can never be unrusted. If I've that makes never sense. thought of rust as being organic, and no. mushrooms are organic. So why that got put into this list, I'm not really sure. But I found that interesting. Uh, I mean, the only connection I can make is like molds and molds mm-hmm. grows on, you know with bacteria blah 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 rust is it it, it does might, rust, there might be a type of chemical change where does let's it say grow water on metal i mean it corrodes 
for sure. So like it spreads across. So, so maybe. it kind of kind of eats the metal. I mean, maybe. Yeah, but I, I never associated it with being alive. Yeah, or an organism. Yeah. Which is like okay. fungus is a organic matter. I, I don't I mean, know. I don't Very know. I'm no, I'm no rust expert, but I don't I don't <laughs> associate it to being a living organism. Mushrooms are typically found near plants and may even use plants as stability as they grow. Sometimes considered a plant because of its edible nature, mushrooms are not part of that kingdom planti, okay. which, and therefore they are not plants. So they're not plants. Okay. They are heterotrophs. This means that they rely on food sources in their surroundings for nutrients, such as animal waste, plant matter, and organic carbon. Maybe that's where rust comes in. I don't know. Uh-huh. A, a mushroom source of food is totally different from a plant sort of source of food. Plants are autotrophic. Yeah. They, cre- they create their own food from simple organic compounds and the sunlight. Whereas mushrooms have to get their source of food from outside of their own self. Okay. Wait, what yeah. are we? We're heterotrophs. I, I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, we rely on food sources outside, outside of our of, own yes. bodies. Yeah, yeah. so we're heterotrophs. That's why I was like, Ugh. see, yeah, mushrooms so, are so closely related yeah, to us. Yeah, they are a lot closer Ew. to us than, than plants are. I guess I've never sat down and been like, huh, what is a mushroom? And like actually done any research at all. <laughs> I, I, I know. And that's why I've got like over an hour is probably worth a note. So this may really be two two episodes. Yeah, it's we're so into... fascinating. I didn't it's, know all this stuff. It's very interesting. Yeah. So there are apparently three types of mushrooms, which I had no idea. Okay. Uh, sapotrophic mushrooms. These are mushrooms that feast on dead and decaying matter while they aid in the decom- decomposition process. They are are mushrooms that release special enzymes that encourage the de- deterioration of um, organic matter. Mm-hmm. Shiitake, morsels, oyster, and button mushrooms all belong in the category of saprotrophic mushrooms. Okay, so we can eat saprotrophic. At least some At least of them. Some. Yeah, so yes. like some of them are edible. There are parasitic mushrooms. Ooh. Some funga- fungi are designed to feed off other plant life. Fun guy. <laughs> We're so fun guys. We're so fun guys. We're Detrimental. Fun guys. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Our listeners are going, oh my oh God. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, Detrimental to the host plant, parasitic mushrooms provide no benefit to its host. So an example of parasitic mushrooms include the chaga mushroom, C-H-A-G-A, and Mm -hmm. lion's mane. Oh. Then there is, and I'm going to try to say this without butchering it, mycorrhizal mushrooms. You did better than I did, than I would, (laughs) not than I did, than I would. (laughs) And that may not be right. I did mispronounce the Ute Indians through two entire episodes. So, you know, um, but the mycelium is often supported by and dependent upon the roots of other plants for structure in these mycorrhizal mushrooms. Mycorrhizal mushrooms also help hydrate a plant that provides sugars to return the favor. So they're not just parasites. They give back to the plants that they take from. Mm -hmm. It's a symbiotic relationship, and both Mm -hmm. the mushroom and the plant can grow stronger and larger helping each other out. And mushrooms in this group include the porcini mushrooms and truffles. Okay. Did you know? Okay. Truffles. Okay. Sorry. What? Yes. (laughs) 3,000 species of aquatic fungi have been found. Oh. And one of them, and it is the satharilla, satharilla aquatica. Mm-hmm. was discovered in Oregon, and it is the first guild mushroom found to grow and flourish underwater. I don't cool like is that. that. I mean, it's, it's very cool, cool, but it makes me fear the ocean and water more. <laughs> it's going to turn us into zombies. Yes, yeah, Sarsaparilla sounds like one of Cinderella's stepsister's names. 
<laughs> Isn't sarsaparilla a drink of some kind? Isn't it? I don't I know. I don't know. All I know this is sat sat. Sa- it's P S A T H Y R E L L A. So, okay. Satharella. I I don't know. Bill sounds like one of not, Cinderella's. <laughs> not Cinderella's <laughs> stepsister. stepsister. Okay. So the history of mushrooms, and I think you've got some inf- information on this stuff too. Because just a little, y'all. We found some really cool mushroom books. Yeah, I'm telling yeah. you, and they're all going to be listed and posted with our episodes. So please mm-hmm. go check them out. So the Chinese culture. Mushrooms were considered the sacred foods eaten by immortals. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I have anything on that. <laughs> but you have Chinese information, but I, don't I you? I do have um, uh, China information. So, the Chinese favor two mushrooms specifically in their lore and mythology. Okay. I'm not okay. going to say this right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Ling, Ling Shai and Shiitake are both of these. Okay. Uh, with a flat cap of red to yellow to white that almost looks like a sunburst, the Ling Shai, which will we will cover first. And oh, yeah, this is from the book. You guys should go get it. I'm going to tell you exactly which book out of our list. Mm-hmm. It's called Mushroom Magic, Ritual, Celebration, and Lore by Sean Engel. I, I love it. It's it such is, a cute book, too, when y'all see the cover. Perfect. Y'all should and go buy it. It's literally like $13 at... Barnes and Noble or your bookstore, or Amazon. I had no idea I loved mushrooms this much. <laughs> oh, I it's so fun. Okay. So um Ling Shai uh has a strong spiritual association in Chinese history. Okay. It is said that if you have a Ling Shai mushroom wild, it can benefit your enhanced enlightenment, not enhancement, geez. I can't read. And I also mm-hmm. don't have my glasses on, so <laughs> be mindful. <laughs> And she's drinking. We got all yeah. these things going together. Yeah. <laughs> the letters yeah. might as well just like get off the page and dance, <laughs> which they kind of do for me because I also am dyslexic. So, yes. <laughs> so it's just a party for me over here. Yeah. Um, uh, it can benefit your enlightenment more than any other herb available. See, this one says herb. Like it calls as if it's mushrooms like and herb. An herb. So it's like more than any other herb available. Wow. One legend, yeah. Yeah. One legend goes that a driven student, uh, we'll name him Mr. Ambition, studied in his small Chinese village to pass the exam required to be a government official. However, when he continued to fail his exams, he shifted his ambition to a Taoist monk living in, in the temple on the mountain and only eating vegetables. One day, he caught a glimpse of his reflection and was frightened to see that he looked ill. At this point, he believed being a monk was no longer for him and returned back to his village, where he began to work in construction. After laboring some time in building up the village, he and his crew found a strange object, and Mr. Ambition pondered if this was a bad omen for him. Still looking sickly, he brought the item to a local fortune teller who told him that this item would bring negativity to his life unless he were to eat it that evening. Oh. I mean, oh. like, hope it's edible. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Magically, once consumed, Mr. Ambition started to regain life in his body. Later that week, a Taoist monk passed by his construction site and noticed Mr. Ambition. The monk asked him to take him to a side and inquired inquired if he'd been eaten anything strange. After talking with him for some time, the monk determined that Mr. Ambition had eaten the Ling Shai and had become immortal. <gasps> the two went back to the temple on the mountain where Mr. Ambition still lives. Oh my god. Uh-huh. And now, as for Shiitake, which is known as known in China as Shunku and I love shiitake mushrooms. Dongo, yeah. Hmm. Okay, no, sh- shiitake is okay. I, I don't know. I like pretty much every mushroom. I like what are the normal ones? <laughs> the button. Okay, I like the button ones a lot. Yeah, me favorite. too. Those are my favorite too. But I do love shiitake. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Shiitake 
has a divine origin as well. It is said that a deity named Shin... (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to mispronounce it. Shin... Shin... Ong uh, bestowed the world with natural treasures, including medicinal mushrooms, which are hugely imported in Eastern medicine, imported, important in Eastern medicine. Uh, The shiitake is still used today as an aphrodisiac, which we can talk about after our our sex magic is an aphrodisiac and promoter of promoter of youthfulness. With its roots in Shingong's uh, largesse. One of my did you knows later on is that mushrooms are aphrodisiacs. Didn't mean to steal your thunder. So (laughs) y'all now know it, so I won't say it. See, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't either. I I love mushrooms, though. Yeah, that'll be our next. I'm dropping things. That'll be our next aphrodisiac we talk about. That's right. Um, Let's see. According to a study led by Steve Bonneville from the Université Libre de Bruxelles, from Brussels, I guess, the first mushroom, the first mushrooms evolved on Earth between 715 and 810 million years ago. Okay, the last they've been around going to happen. <laughs> they, they, right? They've been around a long, long time. <laughs> The early Romans considered mushrooms the food of the gods. Some of the earliest commercial mushroom farms were actually set up in caves in France during the reign of Ken- King Louis the Fourteenth, who oh. reigned. He, he was from 1638 to 1715. They had actual mushroom farms back then. Okay. Sure. So <laughs> the French philosopher Voltaire, which I think we've all heard of. He is quoted as saying, a dish of mushrooms changed the destiny of Europe. And what he was talking about was there was uh, the Austrian War of Succession that followed the death of the Holy Roman Emperor King Charles VI. And he died, they think, possibly from eating death cap mushrooms. Oh. And they think that maybe his wife, who wanted the son to take the throne like secede or something yeah yeah yeah. okay the french introduced mushrooms into their hot cuisine their their you know the french are amazing chefs and then once they introduced it into their cuisine it wasn't long before the rest of the world began to embrace the mushroom as well so by the late 19th century americans were cooking up mushrooms in their own kitchens and prior to that it was the mushrooms were mainly used um, in condiments they weren't actually used as a meal themselves or not yeah. a meal but a yeah. a dish themselves and then according to an article from the Smithsonian Institute from around 420 to 350 million years ago, when land plants were still very new, the tallest trees only stood like a few feet high. Plants were just babies. Mm-hmm. Giant fungus lived on the earth. It said oh. the organ, the ancient organism boasted trunks of up to 24 feet high and as wide as three feet. And this this is from National Geographic in 2007. And wow. it was Saudi Arabia scientists who found a fossil that helped them figure out that these giant things were probably mushrooms. They were fungus anyway. Wow. So, I mean, you know, we always think of the sci-fi fantasy worlds with these giant mushrooms and all of that. That was that was a thing 420 million years ago here. Wow. Maybe it'll be a thing after the last of us happened i know (laughs) after they take over the humans yeah um did you know that the largest living organism ever found ever is a honey mushroom that covers 3.4 square miles of land in the blue mountains of eastern oregon and it's still growing ah i mean basically that's the size of 1665 football fields and it weighs as much as 200 gray whales. Where in the world is this thing? And why haven't I seen it or heard 
about well, it? Well, we live on the East Coast in Georgia, and this is in Oregon. Yeah, but this is a, I mean, this is big. Uh, yeah, <laughs> literally big. Yeah. What? I did mean, I know that. And the physical part of the fungus is what we think of as the mushroom, the part that's above ground, you know, with the little, the, yeah. the stem and the little cap. That is not the whole mushroom. It's only like the fruit, like, you know, how tomato plants grow tomatoes. That part is just the fruit. And it's much, much bigger underground. It's an organism that lives mostly underground and it connects you know, just like in The Last of Us, they talk about how you can step on this mm-hmm. here and it wakes all of them up. That's mm-hmm. that's how fungus works. That's that's wow. how mushrooms work. Isn't wow. that crazy? Yeah. So I've got some folklore about mushrooms. I think you might have some too, but I'll start with fairy fairy rings. We've all, I mean, you can't talk about mushrooms without talking about fairy rings. So pretty much every culture has some kind of version of of lore about what fairy rings are. These are the rings of mushrooms that suddenly appear in a field or lawn. And in the Netherlands, these mushroom rings were said to be caused by splashes left when the devil churned his milk. I guess he was making butter. Okay. So they knew the devil had been devil had been in the yard Uh churning some milk. In Austrian lore, these rings form in places where a dragon's tail has scorched the earth, and that ap- after such destruction from the heat of the dragon's um, tail, only toadstools can grow there for seven years. Oh, right? seven years? <laughs> yeah. One theory in Europe is that these rings are caused by witchcraft, or were perhaps evidence that witches had been dancing, especially on All Hallows' Eve or maybe May's Eve, which I think that would be May Day, which is one of the Sabbaths that I can't think of off the top of my head. And All Hallows' Eve, of course, is Samhain. And so if you're witches dancing on those times, then these fairy rings appear. Native American lore suggests that these rings are caused by dancing bison. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. Some stories say that a human should never step inside a fairy ring for fear of dying young, going lame, losing an eye, being struck blind, getting hanged if you're a thief, becoming permanently invisible to other humans, or being held captive by elves or the fae. Now, I like to read urban fantasy. Mm -hmm. I've, I've said that many times before. And so... You know, a lot of times this fae, this dancing is brought up, you know, the fairies dancing. And if a human dances with a fae, they can't stop and will dance until they die. Okay. From yeah. from the stories yeah. I've I've yeah. read. I think I've and, heard like maybe one or two of them. Yeah. Another thought is that they have to dance for a year and a day before they can be rescued, which is interesting because um, hand fasting is also for a year and a day. So mm-hmm. interesting. Uh, another way to get away from the fae inside of a, a mushroom circle is to throw the herbs, ar- marjoram and thyme, inside the circle, as that will confuse the fae. Or you can touch the human that's the victim who's stuck dancing with iron, and that will release them. Oh, I mean, let me just pull out my handy dandy iron rod that I always have on me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or silver too. I've heard silver. Uh-huh. Fairy rings are said to be impossible to destroy. They just come back bigger, which scientifically, it's the spores underneath the little gills on the mushroom that are what's causing additional mushrooms to grow. So yeah, okay. if you try to destroy it, you're going to spread the spores even more. <laughs> In Scotland, it's been said that mushrooms are fairy dinner tables. I kind of like that. That's so cute. I can just see them (laughs) sitting around the little mushrooms Uh at their Uh tables. In Wales, Laura says that mushrooms are fairy parasols, you know, like little umbrellas. And in in Central America, they have something similar. They say that mushrooms are umbrellas that are carried by woodland spirits that are left behind when they go back to their own world. Uh Oh, and then th- there's a Russian version of Cinderella. Oh, well, see, look, Cinderella. 
I know. Sister, her stepsister. Yeah, top, that's come yeah. up twice. <laughs> twice relating to mushrooms. That it, it has the fairy godmother in the Russian version is old man mushroom. Oh. So old man mushroom is not just the fairy godmother, but also the teacher of lessons, teaches the prince, kind of like in this story, the prince is like Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. And the old man mushroom teaches him a lesson in humility by turning his head into that of a bear. So it's kind of a combination of Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast, it sounds like to me. Okay. They should have made that into a movie. (laughs) Right? Um, Right? Uses for mushrooms. And I think you've got stuff to use to just jump in as you come across your stuff. Okay. So food, obviously. Mm-hmm. It is an exceptional culinary element. They are extraordinarily versatile. Edible species include the oyster mushroom, the portobello mushroom. All of those have endless uses in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. I want to talk a little bit about portobello. Okay. Tell okay. me. Tell me. I love I, portobello mushrooms. I think, actually, I take back button mushrooms aren't my favorite. Portobello mushrooms. Portobellos. I had forgotten I about portobellos as well. What um what we do is we usually have like a grill, you know, it's mm-hmm. like fun. We go and grill with family and everything. And when we're feeling extra spicy and flavorful, I guess, you we get portobello mushrooms. Mushroom caps. Mm. Uh-huh, and you sprinkle cheese in the in the mm. top and you grill it and then you cut it like so that it's shareable. Oh, it's the best oh, thing. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. Mm. So portobello, what is it? The finer uh final maturation Maturation? Mm-hmm. Matur- Maturation. Maturation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> of portobello. I'm not going to say the scientific name because I can't. Um, <laughs> this mushroom is large in size with the cap measuring an average 15 centimeter, centimeters, which is about six inches mm-hmm. and in diameter. The round, flat cap and thick stem is firm and spongy, rather rather ranging in hue. Again, I don't have my glasses. Ranging in hue from dark brown to tan. Mm-hmm. There are dark brown fleshy gills underneath the caps, which also house a small ring from spongy white veil. Native around the northern hemisphere, these mushrooms grow individually in grass near mature manure piles, which is kind of nasty. I know. And on leaf litter near I, conifers, I have to say, such as monetary I, cypress trees. Go ahead. <laughs> my father in law refuses to eat mushrooms because they are grown in shit he won't eat them yeah but not all of them are grown like that i mean obviously they're grown on like decay and stuff like mm-hmm. that but he won't eat them see i guess that's like safe but like portobello mushrooms are so good they are so good they i actually amazing. saw my husband worked um had a boss down in florida and we went to a party down there and the owner's sister had a mushroom farm where it was this dank dark area with all this wood and mushrooms were growing on the wood but there were spiders everywhere in there i would not go in there i would not absolutely not no i can't do that absolutely not i can't Mm -mm. So the tell me more about okay. Portobello. I didn't mean to cut you off, but oh, it's I just okay. It's okay. Thought of my father-in-law with that one. Uh, so yeah, they grow near manure piles. That's fun, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and how it's used. So it's used mainly in the kitchen. You know, the mm-hmm. th- this mushroom is great for sautéing, grilling, and broiling. Which I could imagine a really good broiled mushroom. Oh my gosh, <laughs> my mouth is watering. Mine too. <laughs> because of the larger matured caps, they can be used as me- a meat substitute in burgers and hollowed out as pizza crust for <gasps> an, in like an edible bowl. That is so clever. Yeah. Uh, native to Italy, this mushroom is used in many popular Italian dishes. The rich meat-like texture and savory earthy notes make portobellos a favorite ingredient of home and professional chefs alike. Wow. Now, you're like, why the heck are we talking about portobello mushrooms? Magical properties. <laughs> yes, tell us. That's the portobello. As stated in the entries. Oh, I didn't talk about buttons. I didn't talk about buttons. I I'm gonna I like the button that. mushrooms. I know, but I'm gonna skip that because I want you guys to buy the book. 
Oh, yeah. Good idea. You guys can read about the buttons. I read about the buttons. You need to read about the buttons. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This particular organism is aligned with the crone archetype. Oh. While excellent for grounding and connecting with the sick. Sacral? Sacral. Sacral? Sacral. Mm, I call it sacral. That's probably wrong. I think it can be probably either. Either, This this mushroom is also aligned with wisdom, age, maturity, and even death. Because the crone archetype is symbolized by a waning moon, the mushroom has releasing qualities great for transforming and hexing. Interesting. And I wonder if you cast it during the waning moon, if that makes it even more potent. Probably, Mm -hmm. probably. I would think so. so. Now, how do you use it? You know, how do you use it in your spells? If desiring to use this mushroom in kitchen witchcraft, you might consume it during a waning moon phase to Mm -hmm. initiate a cord cutting spell, severing old tie attachments and opening up a new relationship and experiences. This is also a great mushroom to devour before engaging in divination. One may also eat this mushroom with the intention of increasing wisdom before embarking on a new journey or as an aid in spell jar purposes. Mm -hmm. Um, If the practitioner works with the triple goddess archetypes, such as Hecate, uh, I don't know how to say this one, Kale, Cal? I don't know, Kale. Oh, I thought, oh, I don't know. I thought K-E-L was one. K-A-L-I? Kali? Oh, Kali. I don't Callie, know. Kali or Fates. Once many, once many, once may use, once may use. My brain is. Yeah, you time. have trouble. That That's the dyslexia. One, yep. One may use this as an altar offering for hygiene purposes, which watch the mushroom. So my brain is hurting, man. I'm done <laughs> a reading after this. <laughs> For hygiene purposes, watch that mushroom that the mushroom does not turn over. However, it if it does, it will not affect the spell or offering as transformation is key energy as key energy property. Interesting. I, that book sounds very informative, especially as it applies it to witch magic. Mm-hmm. Well, witch magic. <laughs> Wait, wow. We're all witches witch, yeah <laughs> which yeah no, no no i don't have whatever magic you're doing i have witch magic yeah i i have witch magic yeah did you know that the truffle which is a type of mushroom that grows below the ground it's one of the world's most expensive foods there is one variety oh, of it yeah. called the tuber melon melanosporum and it can cost between $800 and $1,500 a pound. I mean, truffle is so good. It is so good. It's amazing. Some of my, okay, some of my favorite, I make creamed corn, okay? Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize, okay. I listen, have had it before, you guys. Her cream corn is to die for. Cream corn isn't a normal side dish. It's a southern what do you mean? thing. It is. A, I was going to say, it's, it's a southern, southern thing. thing. But it's not normal because parts of my husband's family were not, I mean, they're not from the South, right? Oh. And so I make cream corn for like, you know, Thanksgiving. I just make it. Yeah, I just, it's just a, it's a good side dish and super easy, right? A Southern staple. Yeah. So I usually, what I do is like, I've added truffle oil. I started adding dashes of truffle oil in my cream corn and it's to die for and i make it for thanksgiving and it's not known that think like cream corn is a thing because there was <laughs> i had a family member she brought her boyfriend her boyfriend's from another country and he was like what is this i was like it's cream corn he looks at me like i'm crazy he's like you creamed a corn like what are you talking about <laughs> I'm like, no, how it's funny. Yeah. And so he tried it and he was like, it's good with bread. It's good with this. It's good with this. And I'm like, yeah, I know, man. It's good. It's good. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, I, I think also for spells, we could use truffle oil instead of having to actually, you know, spend $1,500 to get oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> truffles to work with. I think truffle oil would, would work well too. Truffle oil is amazing. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, it's so good. I'm I'm thinking about food right now. I'm so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Mushrooms are also the only other food um, other than animals that have that, quote, fifth taste. I don't, uh, we watch Top Chef. So 
it's a thing. The fifth taste, it's umami, the umami flavor. It's a meat-like flavor that no fruit, vegetable, or other grown food has, but it's not meat. It's a mushroom. Okay, wait. That's so creepy because now if we if we go back to how mushrooms are very similar to us, they have that meat-like texture. Yeah. Meat, like yeah. us. Yeah. Ugh. Now I'm not. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> now I'm kind of creeped out. <laughs> in- inedible mushrooms can also be used for things like they can be turned into vegan leather. They can be okay. added to s- skincare products. And they have actually been tested as an alternative source of electricity. Wouldn't that be great what? if that could? I don't know how. I don't know. Oh, they would just have to hook up a huge circuit board to the yeah, one in into, Oregon. <laughs> yeah, right. Isn't that interesting? Because that, that huge mamma jamma, you just, it, that thing would power the entire world. <laughs> right. Maybe that place in Oregon, you know? Could, uh-huh. Anyway. Yeah. They're running on fungus power. <laughs> right. Because they're such fun guys. Because they're such fun guys. <laughs> You can use mushrooms as medicine. I, I actually have a whole book on medicinal mushrooms, which is oh. amazing. Okay. But the native Canadians, the I think they're called the First Nation, the First Nation, they used mushrooms like the puffball mushroom to treat wounds. Oh, okay. Um, I think they also, the puffball mushrooms might be one of those that's got slightly psychedelic properties to it so it can help with pain relief and that Uh kind of thing Uh, so you're feeling good while your wounds are being right that's that's right (laughs) uh people thousands of years ago used mushrooms to treat infections and wounds because they create an antibiotic substance that kills harmful bacteria i mean penicillin is a a fungus yeah made it's made from fungi Uh Hippocrates, who is responsible for the Hippocratic Oath that doctors swear, you know, we've all heard about the Hippocratic Oath. They used the, he used the Amadu mushroom to cauterize wounds and as an anti-inflammatory. Oh. Diabetes and heart disease were treated for centuries with a doctor saying you need to eat more mushrooms. That was the cure, not cure, but that was the treatment for heart disease and diabetes. What specific type of mushrooms? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think my medicinal mushroom book probably says, but... Probably. uh, Caterpillar caterpillar fungus... (laughs) Caterpillar. (laughs) ...is used to help decrease cholesterol and regulate insulin. And there is evidence that mushrooms can help prevent cognitive decline. There were studies in Singapore that showed that older people who ate more than two portions of mushrooms a week had a 50% less chance of developing that mild cognitive impairment. Oh, that's, that's crazy. That's, that's crazy big, good. 50%? That's, yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. Okay. And of course, you can use mushrooms in witchcraft. Using mushrooms and magic isn't new. There are rock paintings that date back 2,000 years in Algeria the Tassili Plateau in southern Algeria that depict shaman apparently dancing around holding mushrooms in their hand and also having mushrooms sprouting from their bodies like uh, the last of us I know eh, <laughs> no thank you <laughs> the hallucinogenic effect of fungi has always been known and used by shamans and warriors preparing for battle a lot of times they would go they would eat these before going into battle to make themselves strong and fierce and you know because you're stoned you know you're well you're not stoned but you're you're high of some kind and so you're not afraid anymore it takes away that fear yeah. hallucinogenic mushrooms might be used in your divination practice or astral projection i mean we're in no way suggesting that anybody out go out and use those i don't no. know if they're legal anywhere in the United States, they're not legal here in Georgia. If if you do decide to do that, we didn't tell you to do that. No, we didn't tell you to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best known mushrooms, at least in European culture, is the red and white fly agaric. This is also, I think, called the death cap mushroom. Oh, okay. This is the mushroom that most often appears in the pictures that you see in fairy tales. You you know, you're going to see a fairy and sitting on top of 
a mushroom. Oh, it's like almost red. And it's like yes. red, and it has the beautiful white stem. Yes, that is this white fly or red fly agaric mushroom. Okay. okay, but all I can say is, in nature, basically anything that's like bright, vibrant red, you don't need mm-hmm. it. You know, like really the red berries, you know, like red berries on the common bushes. You're not supposed to eat those. They're poisonous. So like raspberries are red. Yeah, but they're not vibrant red. They're not like Mm. red, red. I mean, strawberries are red, red, but like, oh, that's true. Strawberries. Like what I've learned is if it grows wild and it's red. Don't don't eat it. it. Don't don't chance it. Yeah. Your uh, experts believe that the fly agaric was used as a hallucinogenic um, mushroom by Northern European shaman and religious leaders, at which interestingly, it contains two toxins that reduce the body's response to fear. So this is probably the one that they, that the warriors took right before battle because it reduced that fear. It's also a component used in that fly anointment that Ren and I talked about in the broom episode that I mentioned earlier. Butt cheeks on a stick. Butt cheeks (laughs) on a stick. That was a fun episode. Y'all should go listen to it if you haven't. It's our broom episode. It was one of our first ones. We didn't really know what we were doing. We didn't. (laughs) We still don't know what we're doing. We still don't know what we're doing. (laughs) The mushroom also corresponds to fertility, which I found fascinating. So you connect with the magical spirit of of this particular mushroom to ask for help if you're trying to become pregnant. If you want insightful or prophetic dreams, you can place a dried one of these mushrooms on your nightstand or underneath your pillow. In Central Europe, this mushroom is associated with the Yule season. And there is a theory that Santa Claus's red and white suit originated because of the colors of this mushroom. Oh. Isn't that weird? Weird. I think, yeah, it, mushrooms are really good, I think, as like, if you need an earth element for your spells, I think a mushroom would be perfect to uh, yeah. be that earth element in your spell. Yeah. I, of course, went to Reddit because I love Reddit. And of one course. Redditor says, she says, I use mushrooms in my craft for almost any reason, but I would suggest using the reishi or turkey tail for health or longevity spells, or anti-anxiety, psychedelic, or anti-anxiety, and then psych- the psychedelic ones for trance or altered states, and you add add them to food, but not the poisonous ones, obviously, um, to imbue whatever your intention it is that you have. Obviously, you can use mushrooms in your kitchen magic. Yeah. You know, obviously, you can incorporate some of them. <laughs> but only the ones you can eat. I personally <laughs> love mushrooms. That's literally like saying, I don't know, my brain's not working right now, but it's like, you can use it, but only the ones you can eat. But I'm not going to tell you the ones that you can eat. You got to figure that out on your own. <laughs> and we didn't say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you didn't hear this from us. <laughs> One of my favorite recipes is to take those white button mushrooms. My mouth is watering. Yeah, I know. Um, you slice them, you cook them in butter and garlic oil, oh. and then I add a touch of cream and about four ounces of cream cheese and a good handful of Parmesan cheese, shredded Parmesan cheese, and cook that. They are absolutely lovely. They are creamed mushrooms, and it's a very rich dinner if you can't eat meat, if you're a vegetarian, perhaps. Um, it's got that umami yeah. texture. Wow, you just said creamed mushrooms, and I said cream corn earlier, and now they're like, wow, Southerners cream everything. Southerners <laughs> cream everything. <laughs> you can use yeah. them in communication spells. I mean, think about it. Since the mushrooms have this large underground network, they definitely are a symbol of communication. You know, it's a great correspondence to use that if you're trying, if you are working a communication spell. You can dry them in your dehydrator and use them in spell jars or potions, make a powder out of them. Even though mushrooms grow all year, I associate them with fall. I think they're more prevalent in the fall. So they're great to use in fall magic. Really? I've always seen them in the spring. Uh, They really, they grow at any time of year. But I, for some reason, always associate them as seeing them when there's the colored leaves on the ground. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. 
did you know? Oh, and this is the did you know. uh, Sorry, I mean, that makes sense because the leaves are decaying into the ground and And they're uh, mushrooms thrive on that. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So this is the did you know where it said mushrooms are aphrodisiacs. Mm-hmm. But the aphrodisiacal, <laughs> <laughs> aphrodisiacal, <laughs> the aphrodisiacal. <laughs> anyway, wow. that effect is increased if the mushrooms are picked at the time of the full moon. Oh, oh okay. 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 You can use poisonous mushrooms and baneful spells, which we talk about baneful things on our After Dark ep- um, yeah. episodes. Yeah. As we said in last week's episode, you can actually create your own correspondences. So you can look at these mushrooms and create your own um, intent for these mushrooms. I mean, Mm -hmm. you can go and get whatever different types there are out there. A lot of these you can buy at a grocery store or you can buy them at a specialty market for, you know, food wise. Mm -hmm. Then do research on what it is that you've bought and you can use that and you know use those correspondences in your spells Mm -hmm. or you can forage your own which of course is then dangerous because you don't know which ones are edible and which ones are poisonous careful uh different ideas for correspondences to use with mushrooms could be death decay longevity communication transformation and change because you know they appear so suddenly a lot of times Mm -hmm. fertility and abundance because in the past they were uh, like a miracle food when food was scarce in the olden days Mm -hmm. connection to the dead because of the way they connect maybe connection to our ancestors Mm -hmm. you know that might be a great it's not an herb well it might be an herb a great fungus to use in uh, doing ancestor work you know, most spiritual interpretations I came up with are positive. I, I did find a, a dream correspondences, which I thought were really cool. Oh, okay. So if you dream about mushrooms in general, it could mean big and surprising changes are coming in your life. If you see a mushroom growing in the ground, it could symbolize fertility, which might be pregnancy, or it could be fertility in other ways. It could be you know, fertility in your job, fertility and money that's coming into your home or growth or Mm -hmm. new beginnings. Okay. If you see yourself collecting mushrooms, it might mean that big gains are coming. If you see yourself cooking with mushrooms, it could mean that you're turning your dreams into reality. Oh, okay. So really, there are all kinds of ways to work with mushrooms. Um, You can decorate your altar with mushrooms. You can have mushroom decorations throughout your home. One of my kids is infatuated with mushrooms, so her whole room is covered in mushroom stuff right now. Oh, I love mushrooms. I have like... I. I'm even sitting by my computer. I have a little ceramic mushroom. Oh, you sure do. That's so cute. It's so cute. I love it. A little mushroom. I love it. I love it. mushrooms too. Mm-hmm. And there's so much more about mushrooms, but I think we will stop here and maybe talk a little bit about Ostara since it's coming up and I want to do yeah. that before yeah. this reaches. I think we're just shy of an hour on this one. Mm-hmm. So Ostara is the spring equinox. And it is a time of renewal and growth. And in many parts of the United States right now, spring is coming. Of course, yeah. <laughs> in I some mean, parts, it's not. I mean, you know? I, I looked at I looked at my friend today and I was like, is the weather going to stay like this? Or I know it's warm what's here. Going on? I know. It's... She, she looked at me. She was like, eh, no, it's in one of those awkward phases where like you wake up and you need a sweater. But then by the end of the day, you're sweating and carrying that sweater around mm-hmm. with you. I'm like, ah. Oh, yeah, my daffodils are blooming, and usually once they bloom, we get a snowstorm almost every them. year. So, well, I just have pictures of them covered with snow. So we'll see. Yeah. yeah. But the Earth is starting to awaken. It's an exciting time. We're coming back to the light. So you can create an altar with things that remind you of spring. Use altar cards because some places you can't pick flowers right now. They aren't. They aren't there. It's still covered in snow. So you can use altar cards with, you know, 
things that remind you of spring or resonate with you and the coming of spring, flowers, eggs, seeds. I put out fresh bird seed on Ostara every year. I mean, I do at other times of the year too, but I make a point on Ostara itself to put out fresh bird seed for the birds. Start your garden journal for the year on Ostara this year. My husband and I have already ordered our seeds and we're looking forward to starting our garden. He's going to help me with my witchy herb garden. I'm very excited. Uh Uh The colors of Ostara are greens and light blues, pinks, whites, yellows, lavenders, those springy colors. Recipe ideas. Make hot cross buns with the four parts. You know, you slice into the top of the bun as you cook it into four equal parts. And those four equal parts can represent the elements, earth, air, fire, and water. You can even do sigils on the four parts before you cook them. Um, Make deviled eggs. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, let me say, our patron, I have posted, uh, I don't know if it's posted yet by the time. Like this comes out and everything. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it. I think it does. If not, then you expect it in a couple days. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a Ostara egg salad recipe. Oh, yeah. It is one of my favorites, and so I see another it put it another up there. recipe that you're really good at that I think you should post is lemon bread or lemon cake. Whatever oh, you do, I haven't so made it many. in a while. Yeah. I actually mm. haven't made a lemon cake or anything since I've had to go gluten free. Oh, I so forgot you were gluten. That, yeah, that would be a good um, recipe to try this yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, maybe Just I'll do to that. Do it gluten free. Yeah, and make a gluten free one. Make split pea soup in your crock pot cauldron. Oh, and we have a, a one of the recipes of, from our split pea soup on Patreon. Yes. <laughs> yeah, my mine is a lot simpler than that one. I just put I use a ham bone. I do get chopped ham. I've got the dried split peas. I use chicken broth, um, carrots and onions. And I just throw that all. My mouth is watering. I throw that all into the crock pot and just let it cook and cook and cook and cook. Mm-hmm. It sounds and amazing. Right eat now. it with bread covered in butter. And mm. it's just lovely. Can you tell we like food? <laughs> yeah, we're foodies. We've been talking about eating mushrooms this entire time. And now we're talking about <laughs> Ostara food. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so happy, happy Ostara, bitches. And that's all we have for today. Mm-hmm. So thank you for listening. You can find us on our website at www.c3witchypodcast.com. There you will find links to our episodes, our social media, our merchandise, and more. If you like the podcast, please come support us. You can support us either through patreon.com slash c3witchypodcast or on Buzzsprout. Our patrons and subscribers get access to our new bonus series, which mm-hmm, is C3 mm-hmm. Crystals, Cauldrons, and Cocktails After Dark. After and, Dark. <laughs> and in this series, we talk about the darker side of magic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thank you to our existing patrons and subscribers. You guys are amazing. Yes. We consider you guys our coven, which we have now affectionately named Coven C3. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and don't forget to check out my store on etsy for fun witchy things from jewelry to altar decor to familiar collars um the link is in our episodes it's in our thing and the thing and the thing (laughs) it's in our thing where the thing is with the other things you know where that thing goes yeah (laughs) (laughs) so we'll be back and until then stay witchy Woo.